The Psalms of the Bible are a collection of songs from different writers, functioning like a hymnal for the full expression of human emotion. Sometimes joyous, sometimes peaceful, sometimes motivating, sometimes sorrowful, sometimes angry. Join us for this five-week look at how the Psalms are helpful in teaching us about God's heart, the heart of the scriptures, and the heart inside you and I. Visit doxa-church.com for service times or more details on how we make disciples in the everyday stuff of life. Good morning, church. Today we will be reading Psalm 91, 1 through 10. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your right side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tents. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Well, good morning again, everybody. Good to see you all. Some lovely faces out there. Today we're going to be in Psalm 91, as you just heard McKenna read, so if you have a Bible, please pull it out. We'll have some scriptures on the the screens here, but... Honestly, it's great to have a a Bible. If you have an app, too, that could work. Um, Pull that out. Um, It's been great. Your elders and I and our wives, we all got some time away this past week to go hang out at a retreat. And just to let you know, we spent some time praying for one another, but we spent some time praying for Docs as a whole. And there's a heck of a lot of fun coming. And so us going to two gatherings is sort of only the beginning for that. So just be prepared for an awesome fall. Hope you guys are all ready for that. It's going to be awesome. Can I pray for us? Okay, I'll pray for us. Well, Lord, there's lots going on in the world. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of frustrations, broken relationships, Lord. We do pray for you as a good God that you would protect us, that you would keep us safe, and that we might sit in your shade and relax. Might we go to you in times of trouble? It's so easy for us to want to fashion our own protection, Lord, in a world like this, but we do ask that you would ultimately be our protection, that you would draw us closer to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this past Thursday, my wife and I, we got to go to one of her work events, which is really awesome. It was held at the, the, what is it called, T-Mobile Park now, Safeco Field. You know, the one where the Mariners lose all their baseball games. That that field. (laughs) Just, Just kidding. Come on, come on. It's too easy. So we went there, there was no game going on, and we were hanging out there, and while we were there, there was actually a Seahawks preseason game going on, so right next door, as you well know, and there was a lot of commotion going on. So we got down there early, and we were hanging out, and we decided to do a couple laughs and walk around, and as you can expect, a lot of the normal stuff going on down there, tailgating, lots of food, lots of drink, lots of parties, games, that sort of thing, people getting ready for the game. Well... One of the things that's typically drawn in a big crowd like a football game is an open-air preacher. And if you know who I'm talking about, it's the guys with the big signs. And so there was a guy right at the big entrance, the main entrance of the Seahawks Stadium. He had a giant sign, a big black sign. And the black sign read, repent. And he had a big bullhorn and he was screaming out various stuff, you know, as they typically do. But as I walked up to this guy and we walked sort of past him, He really made some, he was saying something really interesting. He was actually pointing at everyone and he was looking at everyone as they walked by and he would say, you're in danger. You're in danger. You're in danger. You need to repent. You're in danger. And he's just screaming that over and over and over to the point where it became background noise. And finally, as people well do, one older lady, she walks up fully decked out in Seahawks gear and she walks up to this this guy and he goes, excuse me. Excuse me, and he finally stops. He says, they're not in danger. They're just going to a football game. (laughs) Now, (laughs) I don't know what you think about these open-air preachers. And uh, let's be honest, many people don't like them because oftentimes they're, they're really mean. 
right? They're really mean. They can be really abrasive, and sometimes it's not the best way um, to get someone to hear the gospel. But I do think this guy was making some interesting points. I think, as crazy as he might have been, he was sensing something that's true about America at large, and many of us in this room even. Many people are out just living their lives. They're going to football games, they're eating, they're drinking, they're going to parties, playing games, or they're working their careers, they're going to school, they're getting married, they're dating, they're having hobbies, and they're in real danger, and they don't know it yet. If you didn't already know, we are living through a spiritual war for your soul. That's what we are living through. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, here's what you need to know. Your own sin, that's your own brokenness, the thing that separates you from God, the thing that causes you to make all your mistakes, your own sin, the collective brokenness and lostness of the culture and the world at large, and demonic powers that are unseen are all conspiring against you. They're all conspiring against you. They collectively want you to walk away from safety, a safety that comes with a living God. And they want you to experience a lack of flourishing in this world and ultimately eternal damnation in the next. And so while you're out living your life and while I'm out living my life, we are walking unknowingly into a spiritual war and spiritual bullets are whizzing by our heads as we go to football games. Now, you might think, I'm sort of like this open air preacher in this moment. Like this guy is making, jumping to lots of conclusions. He's taking a football game. He's making it super unfun by making this really spiritual. And geez, it's a bit over the top. I mean, it seems like something a preacher would do. And yeah, you're probably right. And you might say, I don't feel unsafe. And listen, I'm fine. I've got a good career. I'm dating somebody. I'm married. I've got a good family. I've got goals. I don't know what you're talking about. If you live for anything more than God, a career, a family, a worldview, a political party, or even another person, you are unsafe. You are unsafe and exposed because circumstances can come and take away the thing that you love the most, more than God, and everything that you value will be gone. You will be destroyed and you will not flourish today because the thing you love the most is gone and your anguish for the object you lost might even keep you away, might even keep you away from the love of God forever. Friend, if you love something more than God, you, my friend, are vulnerable. And like our friends at our football game, you might not know it. It's only when you love God more than anything else and go to him in protection to save your own soul that you can be safe. Why? Well, this is what we learn in Psalm 91. Belief in God offers you a spiritual protection or like a covering, think about it like a covering that will keep you safe from despair and from the utter hopelessness that will inevitably come when you lose the thing you love more than God, because it will come. Now, there are two types of people listening today. And there's the first one we've talked about. There are many of us in here that don't know we're in a spiritual war and Everything seems to be fine. I hope through this sermon, you will consider that there is real danger in being unsafe and exposed and not putting God first. But many of you, and I know from conversations, even today, absolutely know there's a war going on for your soul. And you were discouraged and you were depressed and you haven't been in a family to be connected with, a church family, you're anxious. Maybe you know someone you know is sick or maybe you're sick yourself, you get it. There is a war, a battle going on for your soul. I hope through this sermon that Psalm 91 is an encouragement, nourishing message for you. I hope that you would go into this and feel more confident in your faith with God, that you feel protected by him in ways that you didn't understand before. So today today, together, we're gonna answer three crucial questions, okay? First thing, we're gonna answer, What are the benefits of God's protection? Second thing, how do we misunderstand God's protection? And third, what is he actually protecting us from? Okay, let's start with number one. What are the spiritual benefits of God's protection in our lives? Now, in this psalm, we, as you heard McKenna read, we have all of these wonderful images of God as a refuge and a fortress. But what does that mean exactly? Let's take a look at verse one together. It says, he who dwells in the shelter... That's he, that, that, that could be you, okay? 
He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, there's a lot of words here, but the word here, shelter, in the original language, it can be translated like this idea of a refuge, a secret refuge or a secret shelter. It's essentially a hiding place that keeps you safe. Um, this isn't a normal place, by the way. It's a special one. It's not one that you go to all, all day when you're praying before your meals or maybe you're praying for your kids before they go to bed. It's a special one that you tap into to be extraordinarily close with God where you experience unbelievable provision. In other words, okay, there's a deeper level of knowing God that is like a form of protection for your life. You'll be protected from the, the things of the world, the struggles of the world, the, pro- the troubles of the world. But you don't just get protection in this shelter. Did you know that? Did you know that it's, this isn't just like a, a house that sort of keeps you safe from the elements? You don't just get protection, you get God as well. So it's like a special place for communing with God, okay? And experiencing him in special ways. Let me give you an example. Some months ago, my wife and I went to our anniversary trip. We went down to an awesome city. We hung out. We had a great time. It was amazing. We loved it. Spent it four days down there. Came back. A couple days later, a couple months later, I went down there for something, for a conference. And I went without my family. And when I got back, my wife was like, so how was it? And I said, you know, it's really awesome. I love going, but I want to be there with you. I like when you're there with me. So if you have a family and you go on vacation, many of you understand that as nice as the accommodations are and the sightseeing is, that it's not the same if the people you love aren't with you. Do you understand? When you abide in this shelter with the Lord, it's not just about being safe. It's about being there with him because he's an awesome friend and a father and we can press into this secret place with him and he's a real person to hang with. And when we go there, we sort of just forget about the world around us as we meditate with him and we're just breathing him in. But also he doesn't just come, he doesn't just come to be there with us. He offers us a special power. You see, there's trouble, right? The spiritual war is going on and the bullets are flying and there's anxiety and stress and depression and loss and death and all these things happening around us. But we come into his midst, it's not like just meditating on an app or mindfulness practice where you breathe in and breathe out and empty the mind of all of the hard things that are happening. Because when you're done with that, all of your trouble is still waiting for you. When you meditate with God, all of your trouble becomes less important. And so the things that affected you the way they did before no longer affect you. It's not waiting for you. God helps eliminate your trouble. And so we breathe in, be with him. Now, what's the result of that sort of relationship? Well, we see that in verse two. The psalmist says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now, in this verse, we see that experiencing God as our protector gives us confidence. And not just a mild confidence, like, yeah, yeah, God's there, but like a deep confidence. And this is another benefit of being connected with God, right? The more you commune with God, the more confidence you get in him. The more you commune with God, the more confident you become. Because listen, look at the verse. It says, I will say, I will say to the Lord, not I might say, or if things are going well, I think I'll mention it but I will say you're my rock. I will say you're my refuge. I will say you're my fortress. I will say you are my God in whom I trust. Do you have this sort of confidence in God? 100% do you have this confidence? Can you say unequivocally that God is your refuge, that God is your fortress, that you, he is your unequivocal shelter, that do you have the utmost confidence that he will do whatever he says all of the time? Do you have that? Some of us maybe do, right? A lot of us don't. In one sense, it makes sense that you can't say that because really the more you know about God, the more there's more to learn and the more you need to go deeper with him. But in a second sense, if you can't say that, then it's possible you just lack confidence in him. And we lack a deep faith. And oftentimes, friends, just hear me out. If we lack faith in God, sometimes it's because we have a shallow, shallow, casual relationship with him. That that can be true about you, that you have a casual relationship with God. Going to this uh, event at the Mariners uh, Stadium, 
with my wife was really fun, but what was really interesting to me and sort of surprising was how many people knew who I was without me knowing. And I think it's because I'm really unique looking, probably for the, you know, I don't know, I'm a little different looking, but it's also because I happen to teach up front. And so a lot of people knew that I was some guy that was at stage at some point at Doxa. Like, hey, you're the guy from Doxa. And that happened to me a lot, at least a half dozen times. It was really surprising. And it happened a few times, and I'm, one, one of these people, I'm talking to him, I'm like, so, like, tell me, you know, what's been going on? Like, you know, like, how do you know what Doxa is? He's oh, I used to go to, uh, to Doxa, and I hung out, it was great. And then COVID happened, and I stopped going. I said, oh, okay, like, where do you go now? He said, oh, I don't go anywhere now. And that conversation happened every person I talked to. Yeah. And if you're in here, I love you. I love you. And maybe that's your story. I've met a lot of you that have that share that story. And that makes me sad. Not because all those people weren't super awesome, because they were. They were great. They were all, everyone was really friendly. It makes me sad because uh, you're exposed. It, I'm really sorry, friends, if you've been taught and have always believed that knowing God means that you just attend church here and there and praying a prayer at some point. And that like, no matter what happens, you're connected to God. I'm sorry because I really feel like if that's what you believe about Christianity, you're exposed to a spiritual war because you won't be protected when the storms come of life. Because you've learned that whatever you say you believe is what you actually believe and that's just not true. This is a terrifying reality that people can believe they're protected from warfare on their spirit and actually not be protected at all. Many of you have friends that you were in relationship with that church, maybe here, maybe another church, maybe with you specifically, reading scripture, worshiping together, being an actual community, seeing the growth in their family and in their marriage, seeing those things. But now those people that you know have wandered away casually, believe they're safe, but are in danger of catching a stray bullet in a spiritual war because they believe they're protected and they're not. Those people need you, by the way. The people that I've heard stories from, this person was, man, they were in relationship with God and now they're not, oh my gosh, oh, I knew this guy from Mars Hill way back in the day. He was awesome. He's gone. I don't know where he is. Those people need you because some of them think they're protected. They're not protected. They are in danger. That's a Christian faith walk. That's why it's hard to tell people hard truths because there's warfare going on. You're not supposed to be able to do it that easy. Those people need you. They're in danger. Some of you are also in danger too. Some of you as well, they that you believe you're headed to the secret place and you're not. And you're in danger of catching a stray bullet. God help you. Run, run to him, friend. Wherever you think you're at, go faster. Go faster. Stop playing Christian. And go be in a relationship with Jesus. This isn't, this isn't mean, it's clear. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm trying to be clear. If you're not in relationship with God, you're in danger of not just not flourishing in this life, but experiencing eternal separation from him. I'm not trying to be a, a mean pastor. I don't want to shame anybody. I want safety for you. Please, for your own sake, run to God. Because being in the shelter with him, if you feel like you're unconfident, does continually build confidence over and over again. But you need reps. You need reps to learn the way to get into this secret refuge. You need to build communion with God continually. You may lack confidence because you don't know God. You may read about him, but you don't know him. But that can change with frequent visits to the secret place. You don't have to be exposed. You just are. God's open to you. And then you'll gain confidence in him. And then you'll learn the path to the secret place through prayer and meditation. And you won't just believe God will deliver you. You'll know he'll deliver you. There's so much better out there for you. Now, we got to answer two more questions. And 
As we get into the second question, I just want to highlight some things about Psalm 91. This verse is packed, or this text is packed with promises of protection, like really lofty ones. Verse three says, he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the, dead, and from the deadly pestilence. I mean, psh, what is that, right? Verse seven says, sorry, I got my mic all crazy over here. So verse seven says, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Verse 10 says, no evil shall befall, uh, be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. And then verse 11 and 12, my favorite, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Well, those are some powerful texts, right? Real powerful. But it leads me to a question because we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. And the question is this, how do we misunderstand God as our protection? Because that's a lot there. Does this mean no evil will ever happen to you? Does this mean that you will defeat all of your enemies forever? Does this mean you will never get sick? It's really tempting to believe this because we all don't want to get sick. We all want to promise that the world could be something more than it is. Do you say these things? I've said them. I'm, I've said these. God will not allow earthly harm to ever come to me. Nothing bad will ever happen to me if I follow Jesus. The Spirit will keep me from physical harm so long as I just pray. Well, one way to know this is not the way to interpret this passage is this is because that's how Satan interprets the passage. In the desert, Jesus was fasting and praying, preparing for his ministry, and Satan came up to him. And this is what he said to him. Verse nine of Luke four, he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, for it is written, he's, he's quoting, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Do you see what Satan's quoting here? He's quoting Psalm 91. He's quoting Psalm 91, 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12. Satan is saying, throw yourself off this cliff and your, his angels will catch you and your foot's not even gonna hit the rocks at the bottom of the cliff because the, the angel's gonna come grab you and bring you to safety, right? He will protect you. He will protect you. He will cover you. He'll see your fortress. No harm's gonna come upon you, okay? You will be healthy. You will be wealthy. You might even be wise. And heck, for some people, why even go to the hospital? God's gonna heal you. And yet, we all know death exists. We know people get sick. We know that people go to jail. They go broke and be taken advantage of. Some of you in this room. This interpretation, Satan's interpretation, filters the Bible through our desires, needs, and wants. But rest assured, Jesus rejects Satan's interpretation. He says back to Satan, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus responds by letting scripture interpret scripture. He takes Deuteronomy chapter six and, and interprets Psalm 91. And he says, Jesus essentially says, God is not a magic formula that you can just sort of rub on his lamp and he'll provide you whatever you want. He's not a dancing bear on a ball or and he's not willing to jump on hoops through you just because you ask him for something. But we do this all the time. You might not physically say, God, make me healthy, wealthy, and wise, but we do a lot of things. We might say, Lord, give me X. Lord, keep me from Y. I mean, but if you don't, I mean, I mean, are you really who you say you are? I mean, are you really the, the Lord God? I mean, how could a loving God allow X? Or how could a loving God let at why happened to me? How could he? So if God doesn't deliver what you ask, all of a sudden you, we've got questions for him. Real questions, that question is character. If that's us, this is us exegeting this passage like Satan. This is us putting the Lord our God to the text, to the test. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 91 is not against what God sells elsewhere in the scriptures. Psalm 44 says that there will be sorrow, death, and struggle in this life. Psalm 91 perfectly grasps the tension of the physical safety and the spiritual safety and the conflict that we have in Luke chapter six or Luke chapter 21, verse 16, when Jesus' words, look at, listen to what Jesus says about this. You will be delivered up, talking to his disciples, even by parents 
and brother and relatives and friends, and some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair on your head will perish. Jesus here says people will die. People will be betrayed and they will suffer. And yet, ultimate, deep, real harm will never come to his people. Friends, God often allows suffering in this world, and that is a hard truth, but God always forbids that for his people, the suffering will ever hurt them in the end. God doesn't say, I will protect you from all trouble. He says, I will protect you through the trouble. I will sustain you through the difficulties of this fallen, broken world. I will keep you going through the suffering. The suffering in this world is temporary, but it will ultimately bring glory to God as we endure, but it will not destroy us. Charles Spurgeon says this, it is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. In other words, Apostle Paul says to live is Christ, to die is to gain. Now, I'm not saying God can't provide protection here on earth in special circumstances. He absolutely can and he does. But this doesn't mean he always will especially when he understands how far superior the riches are that await those who follow him in glory. God works all things together for his will. That includes the suffering in this world. But now we've got to answer our last question together. Question three, what exactly then does God cover his people from? What does that mean? It's a good question. Look at verse four. It says, the Lord will cover you with his pinions, And under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Now, this is an analogy, okay? It's a metaphor. And Jesus, or God here, is analogizing himself to essentially a bird, a mother bird that protects its young. And pinions are the outer parts of the wings. And so that means when predators are nearby, a mother bird will shield its babies from harm, right? But not just predators, also storms, right? So think about snowstorms and hailstorms and heavy rainstorms. The mother bird will protect the, the babies from getting hurt. And that's who God says he is to you. But that's not to say no one gets hurt in the storm, right? Like think about the analogy for a second. Who... Who might get hurt in this analogy? The bird covering up all of its little ones. The mother bird. The mother bird's gonna take blow after blow from the hail and get coated in, coated in the snow. See, I think we actually think about this passage a little too small. That's what I think, okay? I mean, listen to the language. Terror by night. I mean, is that really like the thing that haunts you? Is that like bad relationships in your life? Or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, is that like marital woes? I mean, those are heavy analogies for like, oh man, I just don't have passion for my work anymore. I don't think that's what God's talking about. There's a little bit more going on. What's the greatest terror we have? It's our own sin. It's our own brokenness. It's the enemy that we cannot outbox. What is the greatest pestilence that exists? It's death. Even if you don't believe sin is real, which I know that's true, you know death is. And you can't outrun that. The hailstorm that the mother bird protects us from is not small, it's large. In fact, it's too big to overcome. So God surrounds those he loves with his wings and what happens to us? We survive. But what has to happen to the bird? The bird is going to die. The sin storm is too large, it's too big, and it's going to kill him. Now, I think maybe my hunch is that some of you got upset on my last point when I said God allows suffering into the world. Nobody suffers more than Jesus. Jesus takes the ultimate bullet himself. And unlike us who pay our own penalty for our sin, Christ doesn't sin and pays our penalty for our sin. And so he willingly 
takes the ultimate bullet. He dies in the storm. We may have suffered temporarily during the storm. We may suffer mental health, injuries, wounds, cancer. I've lost people I love so dearly to my heart. Many of you also have experienced that. But we don't die. For those in Christ, we have eternity and glory that awaits us. So Jesus dies on the cross, protecting those who believe in him from eternal death so that they might live for eternity. Friends, Jesus is the ultimate refuge. When you run to his shelter, he protects you, even to death. Now, you might lack confidence in that and passion for that, and you may do it for a number of reasons. You may do it because I don't care, or you may do it because I just experienced so much hardship. I just don't get it. Friends, if that's you, I want to implore you that you may have visited God's shelter, this secret place, the secret refuge once or twice, but you haven't yet dwelled in his safety. The word dwell means to make your home there. Will you make your home with Jesus? But look, there's a passage here at the end, and I just wanted to show you how God speaks to those that do have confidence in him and do run him. This is what God says about people that find themselves in his his shelter. Maybe some of you, it says this. This is God speaking. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. Friends, God can only say that about you if you're in his shelter, if you run to him. If you believe you'll be fine and there's no spiritual war going on, you're going to catch a stray bullet and you're gonna live a life that maybe is okay now, but you will spend eternity apart from Christ and that will not be good. And you can flip a coin and believe it or not believe it, but I'm just telling you. And again, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be extraordinarily clear with you. You can walk into a lot of places, watch a lot of YouTube videos giving you the Christian perspective. The Christian perspective is this. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. So perfect, in fact, that humanity, us, we killed him, his own people. Death could not hold him because he did not have sin on him, and he rose three days later. Everyone said, and was, when he said that, when he came up, he said, anyone who believes in me would inherit the eternal life. I would take their sin, they would inherit eternal life from me. That's, that is the message of the gospel. And... If you continually run from me, you'll be protected from eternity. But if you don't, if you don't, for whatever reason, heck, I died. Jesus says, I come for the entire world. I I came for you, but you didn't want it. Hey, the shelter's open. You don't want it? It's just clear. That's just what it means. You know, as we walked by these open air preachers at this event, one of them started talking behind me and he started actually talking about safety. I thought it was really interesting. He said, he said a few things in a row and he said, you know, you will not be justified by living a good moral life. You will not be safe by reading the news and trying to teach your kids moral lessons without God. You will not be justified because you go to church a few times a year. You will not be justified by living a life with career goals and financial goals and family goals and just doing your best. Finally, someone angry, of course, walks up to him and he goes, well, then how is anyone justified then? And the guy said, by faith in Jesus. And then the guy said, that's it? And he said, that's it. When you believe in Jesus, you have an all-access pass to safety. Many people think believing in God comes with all these strings attached, that you need to do this and this and this to engage God. Oh my gosh, so much work. So you don't go to the covering. You don't go to the refuge that God is. But eventually, you start to realize that you are in a war. And then you start to fashion for yourself your own shelter. One with medications and hobbies and addictions and distractions and careers. But eventually you'll find that the shelter doesn't work and the bullets start penetrating right through there and they're flying by your head, even with your shelter, as hollow as it could be. Jesus is offering an impenetrable force of protection, one that no storm can blow over. Not even death itself can penetrate 
this shelter. And it's, it's stable and it's unbreakable. And truly, there is no safer place to be than in the shelter of the Most High. That way, God could say this about you. I will deliver him. I will protect him because he, because she knows my name. And when he calls to me, I will answer them and I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Friends, the invitation is open for you to wander right into the midst of the the father. The shelter is wide open. And all you need to do is believe in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, you are a protector, you are a redeemer, you are a defender, you are the most high, you are the God of Moses, you are the God of Abraham, you are the God of Isaac and Jacob, you are the God of David, you are David's heir to the mighty throne. And Lord Jesus, we pray that we would kneel before you in worship, that we would cuddle up next to you in warmth and love. Would we obey you in sonship and in daughtership, Lord God, and would we have faith in you like the good God and savior you are. Lord, there is a war going on and I know there is a war right now in the minds of some of my friends here that the enemy is an unseen enemy and that he wants to believe, to coax people into believing this is foolish, it's not real, it's silly, it's stupid, it's not even a thing. But Lord God, I would pray that you would release them of the hold, release them of the enemy's grasp and that you would allow your word to penetrate, that you love them, that you've chased them down. And the reason they are here is because you want them in your shelter as their son and as their daughter. So Lord God, I pray that, that all evil, brokenness, injustice, loss would yield to the presence and power of the mighty throne of God right now. That you would penetrate these people's minds and might they get baptized and worship you for all their days. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.